Yeah, right. I'm very happy to present our speaker today. It's Professor Andrew Spencer from the University of Essex. And he's a very unlucky person because he was supposed to be with us last term in December, and it was a day of strike. <laughs> <laughs> and then we removed his talk for today, and then there was strike again. But we couldn't postpone it any longer, I'm afraid. So we are happy to have him today here. And, um, well, just for a brief introduction, I can say that he's a person who is interested in many interesting things, uh, like theoretical phonology, morphology, morphosyntax, uh, and has worked on many topics uh, related to all this. In particular, well, I have here a list of uh, his published research uh, topics. Uh, which include, but are not limited to, for example, noun incorporation in languages like Chukchi, which is in Siberia actually, um, clitics in Slavic languages. I know some students are interested in clitics, but that's a good person to talk to about clitics. And he also has a um, book on clitics, which was published pretty recently, a large thing. Um, well, another recent area of research is uh, well, that's probably not very recent, but anyway, the notion of uh, periphrastic morphology and periphrastic constructions. Again, I know some students are interested in this kind of stuff, so that's uh, another thing to, no to, to note. Uh, the notion of morphological case, that's something Andrew has published a lot on. The notion of stem in morphology. Uh, verb prefixes and many other interesting things. This is just, uh, just this is just a brief list of topics uh, on which he has worked. And his latest book, which came out last year, right, uh, is called Lexical Relatedness. It was published in Oxford University Press, and it's a very impressive and interesting reading uh, on the issue of how words are related and uh, mixed representations of uh, lexical categories and things like that. So that's something he's going to talk about to us today. So the topic of the presentation is exactly this, how words are related. Thank you, and I'm delighted to have the chance to come back here to SOAS. Uh, when I worked in London many, many years ago, I spent a lot of time here at SOAS with colleagues. Uh, in those days, I was a phonologist. Um, so I have lots of happy memories of many fruitful uh, interactions with linguists here. Um, since then, um, as Irina said, I've I morphed into a morphologist, I guess. Um, and uh, one aspect of morphology is um, how morphology relates one word to another. And, of course, that means things like inflection and derivation. Um, and inflection and derivation is one of it's one of the things that all linguists know about, even if they're not morphologists. But nobody really has much idea as to what inflection and derivation are and how they uh, they differ from each other. And um, for some people that doesn't matter, and for other people it matters quite a bit. And I'm one of the people for whom it matters quite a lot because I work within a framework of morphology where. Um, you assume that there are words that are inflected, that's one part of morphology, and then you also assume that there are ways of creating new words by derivational morphology, and they're different things. But it's extremely difficult to figure out how they're different, to distinguish inflection from derivation in the most general case. We can easily point to simple cases which are obviously inflection and other simple cases which are obviously derivation, um, but there's an awful lot of stuff in between. And a lot of the stuff in between, these intermediate cases, a lot of those cases are hardly discussed in the literature, which was the main reason why I wrote um, about 480 pages of a book about this stuff. Um, and even then I only covered a small part of the uh, topic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be talking about um, this notion of lexical relatedness. I'll tell you what PRI stands for later on. And um, there are going to be two aspects to this. One of the themes that's going to come through this talk an awful lot 
is um, whether or not, when you compare two words, whether or not they're the same in their lexical meaning or whether they're different in their lexical meaning. Um, and that turns out to be quite a, um, an important distinction. Um, and so you'll see there are, there are two sort of subheadings here. I'll be working from these slides. Um, I don't have a handout, um, but you don't really need a handout. And if you did have one, it would just be a selection of the slides. Um, and uh, in case you're interested in the content and some of the examples, um, uh, then uh, we will make, we will figure out ways of making the slides available, either on my own website or on one of the SAS uh, linguistics department websites. So um, let's let's start out with some very very simple ideas. Um, and the first simple idea is the idea of a dictionary. And um, I'm going to assume that a dictionary is it's a kind of database. I mean, what a dictionary is, it's a list of words and their properties. And I'm going to assume these four different properties or attributes for a typical word. And um, that's about as good uh, a lexical entry for the word cat as you will find. Um, the bit in scare quotes might be improved upon, but not very much. One thing that's... I'm going to have to use this as my pointer. I forgot to bring my wonderful um, laser pointer, so I'll use this as a pointer. This thing will require a bit of explanation, this lexemic index. Um, I've assume, I'm assuming it's lexeme number 59, an arbitrary number, or lexeme labelled cat. Um, and uh, you can think of that as just... It's just like a key field in a database. It's just a unique index so that you can distinguish cat and dog. Um, so uh, what am I going to do with this talk? I'm going to, um, based on that idea of a dictionary lexical entry, I'm going to propose um, a typology of the ways in which words can be related. Um, because it turns out there are quite a lot of different ways. And what I'm going to do is assume this principle of representational independence, that's the PRI. And all that says is that if you've got two words, you want to compare them, they might be completely unrelated, like cat and disintegrate. Uh, or they might be related in some way. And how they're related, well, what I'm going to assume is that you can establish relationships between one word and another by, um, by uh, relating any of those four attributes to each other independently of each other. So that means they can be related in terms of form but nothing else, they can be related in terms of form and meaning but not syntax and so on and so forth. And We'll, I'll, I'll, we'll see some little tables and diagrams which will make that a bit clearer. Um, and that gives rise to an awful lot of possibilities, half of which I will ignore because what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate today on those relationships between words which, in some sense, are just forms of a single lexical entry, a single lexeme. So um, uh, that will become a bit clearer when we get to the examples. Now, before I do that, I'll, I'll return to this inflection derivation thing again, because it's important for us to get a, a, a anchor the discussion to some extent. Um, and um, so what is inflection? Think of inflection in terms of canonical types of relatedness. So canonical inflectional morphology. This is where you've got a word form which realises some inflectional properties of, all, of, of that lexeme. So you've got um, a, a, a good example to think of here is an English verb agreeing in the present tense with its subject. So the girl runs ends in S, third person singular, as opposed to the girl's run doesn't end in S. That's contextual inflection. It's, it, it, it's contextual because it depends on the context, the syntactic context. The S at the end of runs doesn't mean anything. It doesn't add any meaning to the verb run at all. Right? It's not like overrun or um, rerun or any, any of these other bits of morphology which add some meaning. Um, 
runs is also different from ran, the past tense. You think of ran as, as adding the meaning of past tense, although when we add the meaning of past tense, it's not the same as adding the meaning of rerun or overrun or something of that sort. Uh, it's an inflectional meaning, um, and that's what's sometimes called inherent inflection. So that's not quite as um, straightforward as contextual inflection, but those are the two sorts of things which we call inflection. And then there's canonical derivation, and that's where you just take a word and you add some extra meaning to it. Drive, person who drives, drive er. So you add er to drive, and you get another. And driver, remember, will almost certainly end up as a separate item in the dictionary, a separate lexeme, separate lexical entry. Whereas runs doesn't have its own lexical entry; it's just a form of that lexeme. So these, this is all very straightforward. Trouble is. Not all types of relatedness are that straightforward. There's an awful lot of cases which are intermediate when we look at this across languages. And so we're going to have a look at some of these intermediate cases. So uh, here's our four attributes. Um, OK, I've got a sophisticated semantic representation this time. Right, so this is a semantic representation. It's um, uh, a one place predicate with the, that being a variable possibly bound by a lambda expression and it's an ontological category thing um, so we don't know what it means I mean, it means cat, whatever cat means furry quadruped that makes a meowing noise and this lexemic index I mentioned this and this is a unique a unique number in effect, a unique integer, which allows us to distinguish one lexeme from another. And anybody who's ever constructed a database, whatever it might be, a shopping list or anything, um, you know that you have to, um, any database um, assigns a number to every entry so you can keep track of them. So that's the basic function of a lexemic index. But we'll find that Actually, it's quite useful to have this lexemic index. It tells you whether or not you believe two words are separate dictionary entries or whether you think of them as one entry with two sets of properties. So if it's an inflected word like run runs, clearly that's just one lexeme, one lexemic index. If it's drive and then driver, two separate lexemes, they've got two separate lexemic indexes. What about running? As in, running is very good for you. It's a noun. Is it a separate lexeme? Or is it a part of the run verb lexeme? Given it's a noun, maybe you want to say it's a different lexeme. On the other hand, maybe you want to say it's part of the run verb lexeme. Well, once you've made that decision, you record it by saying, well, if I think it's two separate lexemes, I'll give running a separate lexemic index. Whereas if I think it's a form of the run verb lexeme, then I'll give it the same lexemic index as the verb run. So that's, that's the basic um, housekeeping function. Um, I won't talk very much about what semantics is. I mean, that's basically it um, uh, for those that are interested in these things. Um, so I assume that you can have things, events, properties, and relations, and they tend to be nouns, verbs, adjectives, and prepositions. Uh, but um, I won't say a great deal about semantics at all, um, uh, so that won't actually be so important to us. And syntax as well, well, syntactic class, noun, verb. Um, the syntax also has to specify any collocations, argument structure and all that sort of thing, whether the verb's transitive or not and so on. Um, in other words, the sorts of things you expect to see in a very good dictionary. Form, I need to be a bit more specific about, I suppose, uh, though, um, again, I don't need to be too specific for the purposes of this talk, but form basically means, well, obviously, the phonology of the basic stem. So, run is r, uh, a, no. uh, But for me, this form attribute also includes all of the regular inflected forms, um, as well as irregular inflected forms. Um, so, uh, I've got here the inflectional paradigm. So, um, running as in the, the, the child is running, um, that will be a regular inflected form. Ran is an irregular form, but they're all part of this form attribute, and they're defined by the inflectional morphology. That's what I'm assuming. Not all models of uh, grammar will make those assumptions by any means. Uh, some models of grammar 
um, will more or less ignore nearly all of this stuff or, or claim that it doesn't exist and claim it's all syntax instead. So I'm making certain assumptions here, lexicalist assumptions, um, but um, at the very least they're, uh, they're reasonable descriptive uh, assumptions even if you don't want to code them into your theory of grammar. And here's what I think about um, uh, relatedness. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, we, what we do is we compare, on a pairwise basis, compare these four attributes and see whether they're the same or different, basically, or whether one subsumes the other, whether one um, uh, contains the form or the semantics of uh, the, other, um, uh, the other word. Um, so, um, for example, we've seen in, in derivation, um, uh, if you've got drive and then you derive the word driver, then what happens there is that you're adding a semantic predicate. You're taking the verb drive and adding the idea of person who does that verb. Person who is the added semantic predicate then. And that's, that's what all derivational morphology looks like, actually, um, according to some. Now, one thing I will mention, and that is that... Um, for me, lexical relatedness can be a bit sort of wild. And, um, well, I say for me, I, in many languages, lexical relatedness is a bit wild. And in some cases, lexical relatedness is just defined over forms. And there's nothing else that's related. So, um, um, uh, forms or maybe a bit, a bit of syntax. So, um, understand is a, a sort of... Um, uh, emblematic example of this. Understand is an interesting verb in English. Um, on the one hand, it clearly consists of the units under as a prefix followed by the verb root stand. Uh, it's, it's very clearly that. Um, on the other hand, um, the verb stand as a proper verb doesn't appear in um, the, the verb understand. And the prefix or the preposition or whatever under, that doesn't appear either because the meaning of stand and the meaning of under is not uh, um, contained in the meaning of understand. Uh, why do I say that understand contains under and stand? Well, only from a purely formal morphological point of view. So the reason I say that is that stand, um, the stand in understand has exactly the same irregular past tense, past participle, as the real verb stand. And uh, it's not the only verb in the language that's like this. There's a number of other verbs that are like this, um, including withstand, um, and, and withhold, uh, mistake, undertake, and so on. Um, and so you can't really make any sense of that unless you assume that the, the, the verbal bit is the form of a verb which exists elsewhere, but there's no connection with meaning. Now, in English, that's a bit peripheral. There aren't that many verbs that are like this in English. Uh, in other languages, it's not so peripheral. So uh, I would reckon that between a third and nearly a half of uh, the, the, the vocabulary of languages like German or Russian is actually like understand. Um, Non-compositional semantics, but very clearly um, prefix plus verb. Ask me later for examples if you're really, really interested. Um, okay, so how are we going to measure lexical relatedness or um, uh, 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 um, determine whether two arbitrarily chosen words are related to each other? Well, the crudest way of doing this, the very crudest uh, way of doing this, is to say, uh, first of all, can we say that two uh, of these attributes are identical to each other? They have the same form or the same meaning or whatever. Um, and if that's the case, then um, you'd want to say that the, the words are related. Um, and so um, if you've got canonical inflection, then clearly run and runs are related to each other as, as forms of a word. Um, if you've got canonical derivation, on the other hand, everything changes. So, um, so there we have to adopt a slightly different approach to looking at uh, relatedness. We have to say, well, OK, um, if you've got drive and driver, why do we think those are related? And the answer is because we've got this overlap. Uh, the form of drive 
is contained within the form of driver. We're lucky there. And the meaning of driver contains the meaning of drive. And so there's this overlap. So there, um, the, the words are related because of, there's an overlap um, or a subsumption, uh, containment relation between um, some or all of the um, properties. On the other hand, drive is a verb and driver is a noun, and they're completely different from each other. So um, uh, on the, the, syn the syntax attributes, they're, they're completely unrelated. They're as unrelated as cat and disintegrate are uh, pretty well. Um, now, um, I mentioned there's all these different types that are between inflection and derivation, and I mentioned that I'm going to have a look at some of these, particularly the ones that don't change the lexemic index. And so let's have a look at some of these. And I'm going to, as I mentioned, assume this principle of relational representational independence. So what that means is I'm going to try to find examples of all the logically possible different ways in which you can have words which have um, identical form, identical syntax, or identical semantics, or whatever, whilst remaining the same lexeme, or parts of the same lexeme. Um, there's an awful lot of these in principle. Uh, two to the power of four, at least. And um, I, I would argue that you can find examples of almost all of these sorts of relationship. In some case, it's it's a bit trivial, like um, synonyms, where you've got um, totally different forms but exactly the same meaning. And that's not done by morphology. But a lot of these things are done by morphology in certain languages. Um, and so let's have a look at this within lexeme relatedness. Um, and there are these two sorts that I mentioned, as you saw from the, um, the, the table of contents uh, at the very beginning. So there are those which don't involve a change in meaning and those which do involve a change in meaning. So let's have a look at the ones which um, don't involve any change in meaning. And there they are. Uh, one of them is really trivial. Um, I mean, I, you have to mention it, but it's because it's there. It's the identity relation. So every lexeme is identical to itself. It's a form of relatedness. Uh, we have to mention it because if we don't, then um, mathematicians get annoyed. Then there's contextual inflection or inflection generally, and that's where the form changes. So in, in, a, in the canonical case, when you inflect a word, for present tense or past tense or, you know, um, singular or plural, whatever it might be, when you inflect a word, you change the form in some way. The, 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 the form, one form is different from another form. The, the, that's the whole point of inflection. I mean, you can have cases where there isn't any change in form, but that's not, um, that's not standard. So with inflection, um, uh, what happens is that you don't change the syntactic category. Run, runs... Um, as a verb or a noun, it's, it's, and you don't change the lexical content. Um, uh, so you just change the form. And then there's three and four, an m inert transposition and an ordinary transposition. And you're wondering what those are, I expect. Um, unless you've had a chance to read the book that came out in September, you, you won't have the foggiest idea what these are. Um, but uh, don't worry, in a few slides time you will, you will know. Um, so uh, the first thing we need to know about is transpositions. So transpositions, um, these are really interesting phenomena because the transpositions are the things which are absolutely in between inflection and derivation. These are the things which cause most uh, anxiety to morphologists who want to distinguish inflection and derivation. And I've already, so to speak, let the cat out of the bag by mentioning this example of running. Um, I should think of uh, running as an adjective. I know, um, it doesn't work so well in English, but it works very, very well in lots of other languages. Um, you can do this, translate this into Russian, for example, or German or Latin. You know, the running child, or, um, or um, you know, the... You know, a, a, the walking wounded, uh, lexicalized phrase. Um, so if you've got um, a, a de-verbal participle, um, it's an adjective. And you change the verb into an adjective, 
and that means it fulfills one of the standard criteria for derivational morphology. It's like um, a noun, being, a verb being turned into a noun, or indeed a, a verb in, being turned into an adjective, like read and readable. So that makes it look like derivation. On the other hand, what meaning change have we got? If you've got a participle, um, present participle, for example, you haven't changed the meaning. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the singing children is the children who are singing. Or the children singing the song. I mean, you can even have a direct object with these participles if you want, uh, if you stick them after the noun. So the children singing the song, um, that's still a verb, really, uh, except that in a lot of languages it would look like an adjective and it would agree in number, gender and case with the noun children. So is it inflection or is it derivation? Uh, well, it's, it's either both or neither. It's some, somewhere in the middle. So that's uh, one example of the transposition. And what, what, we're, what we're seeing here is um, a typical um, scenario. We change the category of the word. We change a noun into an adjective, or a verb into a noun, or a verb into an adjective. And we change it in terms of its syntax and its morphology. So a participle goes in the places where adjectives go and it uh, agrees in number, gender, case with the noun it modifies, just like any other adjective. It's just that it's a verb and it takes a direct object and that sort of thing and it's modified by adverbs. Um, so, um, on the one hand, um, it changes the category. On the other hand, it doesn't change its meaning. It doesn't acquire a new additional bit of meaning. So you can't say with any confidence, ah, this is a new lexical entry. And sure enough, when you look at a dictionary of Russian, say, you won't find whole lists of participles um, uh, in addition to the verbs. The participle is considered a part of the verb. Unless, of course, it shifts its meaning and, and acquires some extra meaning, in which case that's a, that's a different matter. But an ordinary participle is, uh, uh, doesn't involve any additional meaning. Um, so it's not a new lexeme. And yet, you've taken a verb and made it into an adjective. So, you know, what's going on here? And you can do this. You can take a verb or an adjective and transpose it into a noun. You can take a noun or an adjective and transpose that into a verb, and you can take a verb or a noun and transpose it to an adjective. And I'll just show you some examples of this. Verb to noun, um, uh, ing in English. Um, lots of languages take the infinitive form of a verb and use that as a noun. Um, adjective to noun, well, this is ness, actually, in English. Um, Strange, strangeness, property of being strange. You don't, I mean, what, what's the difference between, I mean, what, what does strangeness mean? Well, it's just the name of the property denoted by the adjective strange. That's all it, that's basically what it means. Um, uh, what about transpositions to nouns? Well, you can have, um, uh, you can have uh, action, nomen, well, yes, okay, you can have, I say that's basically what it means. You can have quite a few uh, subtle meanings, like the name of the quality or the fact of something being true. Um, so uh, if you think about this really hard, you find that there are subtle nuances that, are, that, that distinguish these meanings. But I argue, and I take a whole chapter to argue, that these are just constructional meanings. It's not the same as drive driver. It's different from creating a new lexeme. Um, then we have transpositions to verbs. Now, there are lots of languages where you can say Mary is tall or Mary is a doctor by taking the adjective tall or the noun doctor and inflecting it like a verb. If you don't believe me, there's a whole grammar being written of a language which does this in spades, um, so, uh, which Irina has uh, just been writing. Um, so there's, there are quite a few languages, actually, quite a lot of languages, especially in the case of adjectives, where... Um, if you want, instead of having a copy of a verb, you just inflect the adjective as though it was a noun. Uh, so as though it was a verb. Um, and um, so that's transposing it to a verb. It's not really a verb, it's still an adjective or it's still a noun. Um, but it's being used in the syntactic um, context where you'd want it to be a verb. And then we've got these verb to adjective things which uh, we've talked about already. Um, 
Wow. Really interesting case, and this is really interesting to the extent that Irene and I have written about it quite a bit, and we're um, just finishing just finishing a book on this topic. Um, <laughs> and this is where we take a noun and create an adjective without adding any extra meaning. And um, uh, the, there are lots of languages that do this. English sort of does it. English sort of allows you to take... It only does it with nouns that are, that are basically French or Latin or Greek. But you can do it in English as well. So um, you're all linguists, so you've all come across the notion of a, of a prepositional phrase, haven't you? You know what prepositional phrase is. What's the difference between a prepositional phrase and a preposition phrase? Yeah, you're right. No difference at all. Yes. Um, it's just stylistic variant. It just happens to work. It doesn't necessarily work with other phrases. But So the word prepositional is an adjective, and it means the same as preposition. So the AL doesn't add any meaning at all. What it does, it, it allows you to treat preposition as an adjective. And if we had, uh, you know, agreement in gender and this sort of thing, prepositional would agree in gender and number with the word phrase. Uh, just as it would in French or, or Russian or whatever. Um, now, English doesn't need to do that because we've got compounding instead. We can say preposition phrase. Uh, in languages where you can't do that, then you have to turn it into an adjective. But you're not adding any meaning. You're just, you've got a noun. You want that noun to modify another noun. You don't have compounding, so you have to turn the first noun into an adjective. And that's a relational adjective. And here's an example from this, um, this language, Tilkup, which is a Samoyedic language, uh, actually related to Ninets, which is a language which Irina has been working on recently. Here's the word Ok, which means leader. Um, and, um, oops, um, uh, hold on a second, where are we? Yes, um, this is a, a language with lots of morphology. Nouns inflect for number and case and possessor agreement. So uh, you know that some languages do this. Instead of saying my house, you take the word house and inflect it for first person singular possessor uh, or third person dual possessor or whatever it might be. Um, and Seal Cook does this. And you can create relational adjectives by adding le to the end of the noun extremely productively. As far as one can tell, it's just, you know, it's like, almost like inflection. Um, interestingly, so you can get a word which means pertaining to a house or pertaining to a canoe. So, for example, canoe, um, canoe bow or um, canoe oar. That is the oar of a canoe. And instead of using a compound, what you would do is we add le to the word canoe and you get this, you know, uh, an oar which is related in some sense to a canoe. Uh, but you, the, the wonderful thing about Seal Cook is that you can do that, you can take the word canoe and, and then uh, inflect that pos for possessor agreement. So you can say, the oar which is related to my canoe. An oar from my canoe. Or, you know. uh, and that's not so common. It's not so common. But that shows, this is, this is the crucial conclusion we draw, if you can add this le suffix to a, a possessed form of a noun, that shows that these adjectives really are inflected forms of the noun lexeme. They're part of the noun inflectional paradigm. It just, it's just that they happen to be adjectives with all the morphosyntactic properties of adjectives. So this is one of our intermediate categories again. So this is, this is where um, it looks like a transposition, but it's a transposition which behaves more like inflection than derivation. Um, and just in case you didn't believe any of that, here are the examples. Uh, and they all end in le, and um, possessor agreement shows that uh, they're, they're different forms. Uh, so this is from the word leader. So this is pertaining to my leader, pertaining to your leader, and so on. Uh, you probably don't want to write all those down, but if you do, you can find them in, in the book. Okay. And that's a, so that's another example of a transposition, a straightforward, simple example of a transposition. And then we've got, a, this is a possibility, I'm not, 
I'm not 100% certain that I can actually prove that there are M inert, morphologically inert transpositions, but, but my little typology predicts that they should exist. I predict that you should be able to have something which is a transposition which doesn't involve any morphology, where the form is identical. The form stays constant, but it's still a transposition. You still change the syntax without changing the meaning, without changing... Now, what, what on earth would this look like? Well, here's a possibility. Relative clauses in Japanese, um, and people don't normally, this is not standard, this is not a kosher analysis of Japanese, so uh, this doesn't go beyond the, these four, one, four, five, six walls. Um, but one way of thinking of Japanese is this. When you do a relative clause in Japanese, it's dead easy. You just take your finite clause, um, uh, such as... Um, uh, you know, reading, reading or writing letter in the library, whatever. And you take that clause and you put it uh, in front of the noun, and that's it. You don't, you don't have any relative pronouns, you don't have any uh, relative clause markers of any sort. You just take the clause and use it as a modifier of that noun, just as though it were an adjective or something of that sort. Now, one way of thinking of that is, uh, and, and this is very different from using a participle. If you use a participle, as most languages do, then what happens is that you transpose the verb into an adjective form, and it agrees just like an adjective agrees with the noun, the head noun. But in Japanese, there's no agreement of any sort, uh, least of all this. So you just take the clause and stick it next to the noun, and it modifies that noun. So... Um, one way of thinking of that, so this is, this is what it's supposed to look like um, schematically. So one way of looking at that is to think, well, this present tense verb form, on one hand it looks like a present tense verb form, but on the other hand, it is not doing what a present tense verb form should do. It's not, it's not just establishing a predication. It's also modifying this noun as an attributed modifier. So it's a sort of schizophrenic or mixed kind of category. So one way of thinking of this is to say, well, this is a transposition. In a normal language, this would be a participle. It's just that there isn't any participle morphology because there's, there isn't any agreement morphology in Japanese. So this is a transposition which doesn't involve any morphological change. It only involves a syntactic change. You're using it in a position where a verb shouldn't really be. Yes. Not on its own, at any rate. So that could be an example. Um, one way of analysing that is to say that Japanese permits transpositions of verb to adjective, but it doesn't do that morphologically. It only does it syntactically. Um, and Peter Sells has analysed um, Japanese morphosyntax in a way which is kind of like this, actually, but without, um, without, you know, for, as it were, from the syntactic side of this. Okay. So, in the remaining... How many minutes? Uh, 20 minutes? Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes, good heavens. There might even be time for questions. So, in the remaining 20 minutes minus question time, um, I'm going to get... So that was the easy part of the talk. That was the simple, because we are sort of familiar with, with transpositions like participles, and it's very good to keep, keep the idea of a participle in your head and if you can also keep the idea of prepositional as a relational adjective in your head, that's, got, that's also going to be very useful. Um, and uh, so what you're keeping in your head is the idea that you take a verb and you can just turn it into an adjective without adding any extra meaning. So it's still, a, in a sense, it's still a verb, but it behaves like an adjective. And you can take a noun and turn it into an adjective, but it's still really a noun. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, OK, let's have a look at types of relatedness where we change the meaning. And yet it's still the same lexeme. And uh, here are four ways of doing it. Here are the four logically possible ways of doing it. So they all involve a change in the semantics. None of them involve a change in the lexemic index. They're all the same lexeme. And either we don't change anything at all, or we just change the form but not the syntax, or we just change the syntax but not the form, or we change both. And you don't believe that that can be true, but it is. And the first one is where we don't change the form or the syntax. We don't change anything, actually, except the meaning. 
So what we've got here is a single word with two meanings. All right, okay, well that's bank. You know, Midland bank as opposed to river bank, that's homophony. But there's, some, uh, there's also polysemy, where we think the two meanings are related to each other. And uh, this is much more interesting. So systematic polysemy, um, this is where you systematically have a word which is allowed to have two meanings, or two interpretations. Um, so what would be an example of that? Well, um, one famous set of examples would be container and its contents. So uh, think of the word bottle. The word bottle is a, a word which denotes a container. And systematically in English and many, many other languages, that means that it can denote either the container or the typical contents of that container. How do I know that? Well, because I can, take, I can pick up a bottle. I mean, I can pick up this bottle. Um, or, by the end of this talk, I might, I might drink this entire bottle. Might. Now, the bottle itself will remain, it's just the contents that get drunk. So, uh, bottle means either um, the bottle or the stuff in it. And that's true of, you can, you can invent a new name for a container, and this will be true of that container as well. And um, there is an enormous industry looking at this kind of phenomenon. Um, and in the sort of Western tradition, it's Pustyovsky's generative lexicon. In the um, East European tradition, it's um, the meaning text model and Aprician's uh, work on lexical semantics. So that's, so that's one form of lexical relatedness. And the interesting thing about this is that languages differ as to what sort of systematic polysemy they allow. So in some languages, uh, um, you might get one sort of uh, so, in one language, for example, causative verbs and inchoative verbs, like to dry or to thicken or to widen, they might be systematically um, polysemous. In other languages, you might uh, you might have different words for the causative and, and the inchoative. Um, so that's part of grammar. It's part of the knowing the language, um, knowing what you what is systematically polysemous. The next thing is inherent inflection, and that's this is like past tenses and plurals, um, and other things. So here are some examples of inherent inflection, and um, if it's inflection, then of course it preserves um, the meaning. And my, uh, I would argue that these are good examples, by and large, of things which change the meaning. Did you get that all those down? No. There's a lot. Of, I'll go through a couple of them at random. Um, actually, um, are there any that you particularly like me to mention? I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, proprietive and privative cases. Do you know what they are? No? They're great. They're wonderful. And again, if you want the full story on this, Irina has written grammars on several languages which have these things. So lots of languages which have a case form which means owning or possessing or having X, or N for noun. So if you want to say, you know, um, a girl with a red dress or the man with a spear, then you say, spear with man. Or red dress, dress with girl. Um, privative is just the opposite, not having. So that's like less in English. Um, you know, hairless person. Um, um, another one are oh, causative causative alternations. There are lots of languages where you have uh, where any verb has a causative form. Now, is that inflection or derivation? Well, <laughs> it depends who you talk to. Uh, it adds a meaning, arguably, adds a meaning of cause to read a book. Um, uh, so it looks as if it's, it's meaning-bearing. It's, it's not obviously derivation, it's not obviously inflection, it's, it's really intermediate. But if it's completely regular, then you probably want to say that it's the causative form of this verb. Just like you want to say it's the past tense form of this verb, or it's the passive form of this verb. So in many languages, you would probably want to say that causative is kind of it's a meaning-bearing inflection-like property of that of, of, of any verb. Um, 
And there's another way in which you can... So that's where you change the form and you keep the same syntax in, in the broadest sense. I mean, OK, a causative verb has different syntax from non-causative, passive verb has different syntax, but they're still verbs. You're not changing a verb into a noun. Um, and there are other ways of changing the form and still keeping um, uh, the same syntax, same syntactic class, broad, broad syntactic class, and adding some meaning. And this is evaluative morphology. Evaluative morphology means things like diminutives and augmentatives. And um, there are two sorts. You can have literal ones, where it means a little one of these, table, small table. And there are others where the evaluative component is more important, so cute little thing, you know. Um, and very often these things are applied to proper names um, uh, uh, and kin terms. Now, if they're applied to a proper name or a kin term, then obviously you're not creating a, obviously, well, sort of obviously you're not creating a new lexeme. You don't really want to say, I mean, even, the uh, same is true of hyperchoristics, actually, as well. You don't really want to say that, um, I don't know, a name like Andy is different from a name Andrew. There are different forms of a name that one person has. Um, and in languages with uh, a great deal of um, uh, evaluative morphology, like, say, Russian, you, it's clear that you, you've got a single word which has various forms with different degrees of uh, evaluation, diminutiveness. Um, it's not just nouns, by the way. So um, Rus in Russian, some adjectives can have diminutive forms. In Nahuatl, some verbs can have diminutive forms. So, so this evaluative morphology is quite widespread. Um, so that's the second type. Um, systematic polysemy, and then there's the way you change the form, in, but you st it's still a noun or it's still a verb. It's a form of a verb, form of a noun. The next ty type, um, I call this the angestellte noun um, type. Um, I suppose I could have thought of a more pronounceable name for this, but I, I like this. Uh, it, it's, it's named after one of my favourite examples. So angestellte is a German word and I hate doing this with native speakers in the audience, but um, I can't really get away with it. <laughs> but this is, a, uh, this is a noun, which means um, employee, a person who is employed. Uh, and you notice I've got these brackets around the, um, the R. And the reason for that is uh, German speakers are very, very acutely aware of um, sexual politics. So nowadays, whenever you use a word which denotes a human being, you've got to put it in the feminine and the masculine form. And that's why you see, you know, um, dear Leserin, uh, with a slash, you know. And this is the same thing. Without the R, it's a feminine employee, and with the R, it's a masculine employee. How do I know that? Well, because um, uh, these are forms of the adjective, and this is what these are the adjective agreement forms you would get if this was an adjective. And the thing is that this is an adjective. It's actually a participle. It's a, it's a transposition as well as being um, an English delta noun. It's, it's, it has the, all the forms of an adjective, but it's used as a noun. And in the syntax, it's, it's a noun, basically, except that um, it takes all the endings you expect from... Uh, an adjective, uh, including the difference between definite and indefinite context, where you get different sets of endings depending on whether there's an employee or the employee. Um, this happens in other languages, not just German. Russian has it as well. Um, so you just take an adjective and use it, uh, an adjective that can denote a person, and use it to mean that person. And uh, it's really quite systematic. Um, and so what's happening here is that you change the syntax, but you don't change the form. It's still an adjective. It looks like a, exactly like an adjective. But in the syntax, it behaves exactly like a noun. Um, in principle, you might get this with other categories. And uh, arguably, you get this with these wonderful American Indian languages where, uh, where you can take, you basically, you take a clause and you use that as a name of something. So uh, Navajo is full of these things. Uh, if, you, if you just browse through any, any decent dictionary of Navajo, you'll see, um, you'll see hundreds of these. 
uh, sorts of things. My favourite example is the word for um, uh, university scholarship. The word for university scholarship is actually two words, and it translates literally as um, um, with it I pay for teaching. And that's my university scholarship. Your university scholarship would be with it you pay for teaching. Um, and this is, this, is the, this is the noun, meaning scholarship, stipend. Um, Dancers with Wolves, uh, if any of you are old enough to remember the film, Kevin Costner. Uh, for many years, I, uh, when, I, well, no, from, when I first saw the title, I thought, ah, um, uh, Dancers with Wolves. So this is wolves and there are various dancers that are going to take place. I thought Dancers was a noun. Stupid, I should have understood this is Lakota, this is Sioux. It's a verb. So, so the, the Sioux Indians saw this chap dancing around a, a, a campfire at night when there were wolves uh, watching him, and they thought he was mad, which, <laughs> reasonably enough, and that's a very salient property. And a salient property is what you use to name somebody in these cultures. Um, so what did they call him? They called him, he dances with wolves, which is a sentence. Um, but that's not the name of the film because um, Lakota is a pro-drop language, so you don't have a pronoun. You just have the agreement. So dances is he dances and with wolves. And so, so that's a whole sentence, but it's a noun. In fact, it's at somebody's name. And so what you've got there is a verb being turned into a noun, but it's still a verb. It's the, it's, in fact, it's an entire sentence. Uh, other types aren't so likely, so I won't bother talking about them. Um, and we'll go to meaningful transpositions. Now, at this point, you should be thinking, now, hang on a minute, for goodness sake. I mean, it's bad enough having dancers with... Well, you have just explained to us what a transposition is. Right? A transposition is where you change the form of the word from verb to an adjective, and you change its syntax, so it behaves like an attributive adjective although it can also take a direct object and that sort of stuff. But it, it's sort of external syntax is that of an adjective agreeing with a noun. And the crucial thing you said, not, you know, 27 minutes ago, the crucial thing about a transposition is that you don't add any extra meaning. That's the crucial thing. So how can you have a meaningful transposition? A transposition which adds semantic content? Well. I don't know, you just can. So, this is a canonical transposition, no change in meaning, and this is a meaningful transposition, and here are some examples of them. They're going to come from our friend Silkup. Now, remember, Silkup has relational adjectives, ordinary prepositional type relational adjectives. You take a noun, you add le to it, and you get pertaining to leader, pertaining to canoe, pertaining to whatever the noun is. But there are two other types of adjective, two other types of adjective which are very similar. They end in le as well, but they have slightly different suffixes. And one of them means similar to noun. So it's a canoe similar to, you know, a, a boat which, is, which looks like a canoe. So that would be canoe-like boat. In fact, it's sort of like the word canoe-like in English. So there's no hyphen. And then there's another um, type of um, suffix which means located at. So the sort of inner canoe, whatever. So the, the oar in the canoe, an inner, an in the canoe oar. Now the crucial thing about these um, the two crucial things. One is that there's a change in meaning, similar to located at these, you know, it's meaning. <laughs> the other thing is that, formally speaking, morphologically, these things behave exactly like the relational adjectives because they're inflected for possessor agreement. Now, what does that mean? It means that you can say, a boat which is similar to my canoe or a boat which is similar to their canoe, or, um, uh, or um, I don't know, a table which is located in the house belonging to you two, to your house. Um, in other words, 
we've got this meaningful, meaning-bearing piece of morphology which creates an adjective from a noun, but it still inflects the possessor agreement. So it's still part of the possessive inflectional system. It's still a noun lexeme. It's just that it's changed its form, it's changed its syntax, and it's got some extra meaning. That just proves that uh, it's true. You can see all these different... So they all end in le, and these end in shai, which is like, and these end in, well, <laughs> something quite complicated, but um, basically they end in something which is similar to a locative case ending. Um, this is an inflectional paradigm. It's just that it's, uh, it's also a transposition. And here are a couple of examples. Um, so here's, uh, th this is just um, summarized seal cup. So this is clothing made out of bare skin, pure relational adjective, skin pertaining to a skin, clothing. And this is similar to a boat, a big boat. Notice we can modify boat with big, so it's... Uh, and this is uh, located in a large forest. So this just, this just proves I'm not making it up completely. Um, notice that you can say in a large forest or in a big house or in whatever. So that means that the adjective big thinks that forest or house or canoe is still a noun. It thinks it's still a noun lexeme. Once you get to the end, it suddenly turns into a, a, a meaning-bearing adjectival word, but it, it's still really a noun, which is why you can still modify it with an adjective. So, yeah. so that summarizes our transpositions. Um, and the crucial thing is that you can have some, you can have transpositions which involve an additional semantic predicate, but they're still pr transpositions. It's still a form of a single lexeme. And uh, I like that because uh, my very, very crude typology, when I say, is it the same, uh, uh, is this attribute the same or different? Uh, and if it's different, is there overlap between one and the other? That basic crude ty typology predicts that these things should exist. Um, so the fact they do is, is, is quite nice. Uh, but also it shows that, well actually what it, what it shows is that you don't, you don't really want to ask questions like, is this bit of morphology inflection or is it derivation? You don't want to ask that question because most of the time with this typology you get a crazy answer or an, in, uh, an incomprehensible answer. The real question you have to ask is not, is, it, is this inflection or is this derivation? What you have to ask is, okay, given these four attributes, form, syntax, semantics, and the lexemic index, which of them get changed compared to you know, the, the, the base form that you start out with or the base form you're comparing it to? And the answer is, for um, remember, we, we're only looking at the ones where the lexemic index is the same. So the answer is, any of them can be changed. This is the principle of representational independence. Any of them can be changed independently of the other. So the question you should ask is, what exactly has happened? What exactly is the difference? And when you specify that, you don't need to worry whether it's inflection or derivation. Inflection turns out to be at one end, and derivation is at the other end, where the meaning is changed and the lex uh, lexemic index is changed. Uh, but you don't need to ask... Uh, what, the, what the correct name is for all the other intermediate cases, um, whether it's really inflection or really derivation, you, don't, you, you just need to specify what has actually happened. That's the idea. Um, so this is what I've just been saying. Um, and um, as I say, I've, I reckon I've managed to identify examples of all of these different types of lexical relatedness, um, and um, I'd like to think that that helps us to solve uh, what would otherwise be quite a, a difficult problem in morphology for people who want to distinguish inflection from derivation. You can do, but there's a lot of other types of lexical relatedness to talk about as well. Um, and uh, rather than worrying about whether transpositions are really derivation or really inflection, for example, uh, you don't do that, you just say what exactly is the relationship between the base word and the, the derived word you're comparing. And once you've done that, you don't need to answer any other questions.
But I will answer any questions that you do have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It looks like this room is not needed, so we can stay here a bit longer and ask questions, and then we'll, we can go and have a drink at the Institute of Education, I guess. Uh, are there any questions? Of course, Lewis has a question. <laughs> 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 Just can't keep quiet. A number of questions, but I missed the beginning, so I'm going to ask you what you said. But since you have so convinced you to construct infection derivation, I then started wondering why, why you would bother with it. And then I was thinking people who believe in inflection derivation, do they have reasons for believing that inflection derivation exists? Or is it, is it a hangover from descriptive grammar? Or is there something which you might be losing by deconstructing them? You know, I, I was thinking maybe of interaction with syntax, you know, lexical thing versus structural thing, that sort of thing. And, and if, you, if there is something you would lose, how do you recover it? Yes, it's... Um in a way, this is a topic of uh, another talk, but so I'll, I'll try and be as concise as I can. Um, basically, there are, there are two ways of thinking of, uh, especially inflectional morphology. Um, and one is the way that you're taught in sort of LG100, and uh, I'm going to use this. Oh. I, I promised I would. I promised you, Mina, I would use the whiteboard, and yeah. I'm going to. So here's cat, and here's the plural. And that's a plural morpheme, and it means plural. And you add it to cat, and it means plural of cat. And everybody agrees with that. And it's obvious, isn't it? Um, except that people like me don't. Um, we think that's a, complete, a completely wrong way of looking at inflection. What we say is that there are two forms. There's cat and there's cats. And this is the result of applying a rule which um, expresses a feature value plural number. Um, this by default, if it's used in the syntax, um, then uh, by default this expresses uh, the value singular number. Um, uh, but at no point do you list this as a separate lexical item with the meaning plural. Uh, what is, is simply a form, um, just like men is a form which happens to be a suppletive way of realising this, uh, this property. So we have this paradigm, very simple paradigm, singular and plural, and um, to get the plural there's a rule which sometimes is overridden by some exception, and for the singular it's the default, it's the, what, what happens if you don't do any morphology. Um, and that's how we do it, that's how we do it in flexion. And there are no morphemes in this model of morphology. That is, um, uh, this is a realizational uh, approach to morphology. Why do we do this? Because when we look at really complex paradigms, what we find is that there are all sorts of relationships between the different cells in the paradigm that we want, we want to um, define. And we can only do that um, simply if we, um, if we uh, use these, this sort of feature representation and just say that, the, that this is a form which, which systematically realizes this property, um, possibly amongst other properties, and maybe there are other meanings that it, that it would uh, realize. Uh, if, if you adopt the morpheme approach, then actually there's no problem, because there's no distinction between inflection and derivation. You've just got two different morphemes. You've got ER morpheme added to drive to give you driver. You've got the Z morpheme added to cat to get cats. And you've got the food morpheme added to cat to get cat food. So all morphology is compounding, if you believe in morphemes. Um, and the problem with that is that when you look at complex inflectional systems, it tends not to look very much like compounding. Now, um, this is very controversial, because if you talk to a distributed morphologist, a minimalist syntactician, they will say, oh yes, it does. It looks exactly like compounding. Uh, that's how we do it. We, that, that's how uh, distributive morphology and minimalism does inflectional morphology. Uh, it's you, you take morphemes and you put them onto trees, and the, the roots move up the trees and collect these other morphemes, and it's a form of compounding. And so there's this big controversy between the distributed morphologists and um, uh, uh, those who subscribe to similar models and those who subscribe to the realization of models. Now, that's the background, and if you believe in this realization type of model, 
You won't? Well, the problem is that this, this is only true for the Lexeme cat. So when you've got derivational morphology, totally new der inflectional paradigm and this sort of thing, so if there's no systematic foolproof way of distinguishing inflection from derivation, then we have problems, those that believe in this model of inflection, because we really do need to distinguish inflection from derivation. And so what, what my model is trying to do is to say, well, yes, you, you can do that, actually. Um, uh, you, can, you can have your cake and eat it. Um, uh, but um, only if you make certain slightly radical assumptions about derivation and morphology. Um, for that, you have to read the book. Because <laughs> that, that is another talk. That's definitely another talk. Maybe Lutz has another question. <laughs> Maybe, yes. I'll ask one other one. Um, okay. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, again, I missed the beginning. Um, but, but in the lexical index, it seems like you assume that there are nouns and verbs and adjectives and things. But you could you could play the same game. You are playing with derivation inflection with the lexical categories and, and think of, you know, there's the old category switch, the image that's on how. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And John Anderson's case from a. So yeah. deconstruct the, the lexical categories and say, well, there's, there's you know, predictive features and preferential features, and they yeah. have different, you know, different combinatorial properties. And that gives you the noun on the one and the verb on the other, or the inflected, fully inflected tense verb on the other, and then the definite or the name at the other, and the in between. And that would, that would in a sense, maybe be a kind of analysis to these in between cases you have, where it's not quite clear is it a noun, is it a verb, is it an adjective? Um, because for these guys, it's sort of easier because they say, well, it's three quarter P and one quarter N or, or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. And then you can get that. Is that yeah. compatible? Yeah. Um, so, um, and I have a story about um, feature decomposition, which basically says, well, whichever set of features you choose, if they're binary features, it's not going to work. Um, basically, because uh, uh, people choose binary features, plus or minus n, plus or minus v, because they want to be able to say, well, nouns and adjectives are kind of similar, so they're both plus n, and verbs and prepositions are kind of similar, so they're both plus. But the trouble is that if, if I'm right that you can have transpositions from anything to anything else, then whatever works really well for verb to adjective and makes verbs and adjectives look similar will make verbs and nouns look very dissimilar and vice versa. So you, with binary features, you can't get all the transpositions neatly. Um, but in any case, um, I, uh, I approach this category squish question in a slightly different way. So the idea is, uh, in many cases, you look at this and you say, well, is it really a verb or an adjective? Is it really a noun or a verb? And, and um, usually the discussion uh, is based on um, nominalizations of verbs. Um, and uh, English has some lovely examples of this. Uh, but actually, I gave an example in German of uh, a word, um, where are we? Yeah. A word which um, looks, as far as the morphology is concerned, it's definitely an adjective. And as far as the syntax is concerned, it's definitely a noun, though with some adjective properties. So um, this is another kind of squish, in effect. And in fact, almost all of those intermediate things are really squishes. And so what I'm claiming, and in a way, my principle of representational independence is what guarantees a certain degree of squishiness. Because if you can relate two words in any way you like, keeping the form constant but changing the syntax, keeping the syntax constant but changing the form, and so on and so forth, then you're going to get these squishes these intermediate categories. And so the question is, how do you get more subtle squishes? Well, you just factorize the lexicon even more. And so you have different um, sub-properties of the syntax um, attribute, for example. Argument structure properties versus pure category, uh, categorial properties. Um, and uh, different properties in the morphology as well, you know, and so on and so forth. So th that's basically how I, how I get those sorts of um, uh, uh, intermediate categories. Um, and again, I don't have to quantify this, and I don't have to, I don't have to label any of them, because what I do is uh, I say, well, you've got the property of form 
and there's the property of inflectional class and whether it's uh, morphologically an adjective or a noun and whether it's this, that and the other. And by specifying each of those separately, I can get these very subtle differences. For most ordinary words, of course, it's just done by default. So I say, it denotes a thing, therefore it's a noun in the syntax, therefore it inflects like a noun in the morphology. And that's done by default. And, and this is another uh, answer to one of Lutz's questions, because we use default uh, logic, where we say, unless I tell you otherwise, assume the obvious. Um, and that, that's, a, that's another controversial um, uh, um, theoretical device, the use of default logics. Um, because um, uh, you get, to some extent, you get that with distributed morphology, but for example, with HPSG and LFG models of syntax, it's quite difficult to get default logic into into the syntax. So there's there's another um, or sort of orthogonal controversy um, that uh, I'm relying on here, or that that I'm uh, taking a stand on. So so I, I make a lot of use of defaults, and they're overridden by these special cases. So the intermediate cases are special cases, exceptional cases in a sense, maybe systematically exceptional, which are overriding the defaults. And um, the default cases are just canonical inflection and then canonical derivation. Any questions? I'm sure Luz has more questions. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably, so yeah. Questions. Yeah. 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 This is a small question about um, English nationality. Names. Oh, so when yeah. You say things like, um, uh, let's say, I love the French, mm -hmm. not I love our French. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, I love an American, but not I love the American. So what, what's going on there with the. What's going on there? The That's a very good question. Um, I'm stalling slightly because I remember reading something about this not long ago, and I'm trying to remember who it was who wrote it. Um, it might have been an anonymous abstract. I think I've spent most of my life recently reading anonymous abstracts uh, and anonymous papers I'm reviewing, but um, uh, that's an extremely interesting question. Um, and it's another very good example of one of these sort of squishy categories. Um, and um, it's in English, you know, it's not just uh, ethnonyms. So it, it's it's really obvious with um, words referring to uh, people uh, people's ethnic um, affiliation in the broadest sense. So the French, the English, and so on. Um, so it tends to work with plurals or, or well, actually, it tends to work with generics. So the French. Um, if you say the French, you mean all of them. Whereas if I've got a group of students here, and I've got some Italian students, and some French students, and some Russian students, um, I could say, you know, well, you know, the Russian drinks a litre of vodka a week. But usually uh, that would be, or Russians drink a litre of vodka a week. But um, I couldn't use that to refer to those Russians that are sitting in the corner there. So it's, n it's not referential in that sense, it's generic. Um, uh, whereas in other languages, I could do that very easily. I could use that to refer to those particular people I've been talking to. So that was the, the example you were giving. Um, and this is related, to, this is more general though, because uh, you can take adjectives in English referring to people, and they have exactly the same property. So. Um, again, um, this talk seems to revolve around film titles, but you've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, that, you might think that refers to three characters in the film, but actually, the way we use those terms, they're generic. Um, and, you know, the rich and the poor. So, uh, if I divide you into uh, those who have got more than five pounds in your pocket and those who have got less than five pounds in your pocket, I'm dividing you into the rich and the poor. But I can't refer to you as, I can't say, oh, um, uh, you know, the poor um, uh, can leave now. I mean, I'd have to say the poor ones or something of that sort. Um, the poor is, is a generic term, and, and so it has exactly the same the same property as the French and the English. 
So I think it's part of a more general thing. And I actually have a little note to myself to, to write something about this, because I, I would like to know the answer to your question, basically. And why English is so weird compared to any normal language. It's just a comment, really, but it seems like things like the French and the English are more like mass, whereas the American, which is more like kind of camp math. Well, yes, yes, because um, uh, because French and English, uh, I mean, the reason is because um, it seems to be because French and English are that they look more like adjectives, whereas American, for some reason, it is an adjective, but it's sort of treated as a noun, I, and I don't know why that is either. Um, in languages with, with decent morphology, you can tell whether it's morphologically an adjective or a noun. Uh, but in English, um, so, you know, these English delta now, they're morphologically, they're clearly adjectives, um, even if they behave like nouns. Whereas um, in English, it's just not enough morphology, so it's really quite hard to tell. But uh, it is very puzzling. Why should American, um, why doesn't American behave like French? Um, so why can't you say, you know, the American, um, the American are coming? Well, how, how many nationalities do behave like French? Um, uh, well, Germans. Um, so uh, things ending in an, especially ending in, yeah, tend to behave like American. Yeah, but uh, things how, ending how many in, do behave in like ish. French? Things ending in ish tend to behave like French. So the English, the Danish. Oh. Um, the Dutch, the Dutch, yes, um, uh, which is com and Dutch is a good, nice. So, so yeah, French, much a minority. so French is a suppleted adjective, um, uh, and it's clearly an adjective because we you know it's, it's normally used as an adjective, isn't it? The French flag. Uh, so it's a suppletive adjective from France, um, which um, is then transposed or turned into a noun to mean person from, a person of that um, ethnicity. Um, and the same true of English and Danish and so forth. Um, You've got all the E's as well, Chinese. And the E's to Japanese, Chinese, yes, they behave the same way as uh, French. Uh, so there's a, a collection of endings which tend to cluster in the same way. Um, Dutch is very interesting because it's completely suppletive. So that's so because the word for the word for the Netherlands in English is Holland, and so um, Holland and Dutch are completely unrelated to each other. So um, uh, yeah, so, but but ethnonyms are always very. I mean, almost every language has strange um, things to say about its ethnonyms. But uh, but English is particularly strange because of that. And I think, as I say, it interacts with this thing about you can use uh, almost any adjective that can denote a person can be used uh, generically to mean people with that property. Although one kind of example, I think Scott, Scotland, Scottish. One of our Scott, the Scottish. Yeah, that's, yes, that's, that's a nice example. Yes, that's, um, that's, what, that's what the language should do throughout. That's, that's, so there's one regular example and all, <laughs> but typically they're irregular, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice example, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, please do join us for a drink, I guess, and Lutz can ask his further <laughs> questions there in a few minutes, right? Okay, thank you. Let's thank Andrew again. Thank you very much.